Before I speak or uh, give my presentation, I've got a message from His Highness Khan of Khalat to read out. Actually, Munir has made my life easier. If most of the slide I sh uh, more or less the same. So, first of all, the speech which I'm going to read on behalf of Khan of Khalat, and it is my view as well. My fellow Baloch, Baloch brother and sister, I regret I could not be here today with you in person. I would like to congratulate Munir and his team for organizing this event. My dear Baloch, we are at the crossroad of history where we can either become an independent country or be amongst nations which have perished and are long forgotten. My message to you is the message of unity. Let us unite as Baloch on the common policy of freedom for, for the Baloch. Let us send a message to the world that we are one nation. Let us draw a roadmap to freedom. I invite all organization, intellectual and sardar to join for the common cause of the Baloch nation and get over this cobble among ourselves and move in the interest of Baloch and Balochistan. All the Baloch have a stake in Balochistan. It does not belong to one group or tribe. It belongs to all the Baloch. The council has full mandate to choose its own leadership. The task of the council is to raise, uh, rise against the atrocities imposed on us by our oppressors. Time has come for us to overcome ego and self-interest and unite as a nation. As a single, united and strong nation, no one can impose their will upon us. We face a ruthless enemy. Indeed, our own history and history of Bangladesh is a testimony to the ruthless nature of the oppressor. Army can defeat armies and organization, but it can never defeat a nation. The international uh, companies are making a lot of investment in the Baloch resources. We, the Baloch, think it's a theft, and we, and we have all the right as sons of the soil to oppose this kind of theft and we will defend our resources at all cost. The international community is, in, is informed that we, Baloch, are not obliged to honor any deal with, made with oppressors, as we, the Baloch, are the owner of these resources. We are not against investment. On the contrary, we welcome international investment in a free environment in, Baloch, in, which, in which the Baloch nation and the Baloch benefit. We realize that we have to live in a global uh, community. We have to be as an independent, sovereign people and nation. We all attending will make it possible today, inshallah, and this is going to be the beginning of a new dawn for the Baloch nation. Before I can actually ask uh, for uh, strategy of the enemy, well, we need to identify who's our really an enemy is. Who do we regard as our enemy? Who do we regard as our friend? If I throw the question on the floor to you guys and ask you, who's the enemy of the Baloch? Most probably you'll come up with the answer, Pakistan or Iran. In my opinion, I differ, uh, is United Kingdom. It is the United Kingdom which divided our countries into along the lines of General Gord's midline, Durand line, gave 50, nearly 50% of Baluchistan to Iran as a piece of cake. Take it, what moral authority UK had to do that? Except the authority of the might. Might is right, that's what has been practiced. And then it divided Baluchistan into further. Uh, it was not satisfied giving this part to Iran, but then it divided Baluchistan into tribal Baluchistan, British Balochistan and lease some of the territories. Fair enough, you did that. You are an imperial force in that region. What I would call a rather 
a she devil you know not the devil with the two horn and tail but a clever devil when this devil left the region it gave birth to a child and that child is known as pakistan and this child if you look at it never in its history because it's been carved out out of india on the ground of religion i don't understand it in modern sense of the word how a religious entity can be a nation you have different uh, organization uh, uh, group of people the baluch the patan the sindhis uh, the bengalis at one time uh, other minority small minority like the baltistanians and uh, the, the sindhis the most of the flags which were flying at the time to call for pakistan what the baluch and what is called north west frontier province and today they are demanding i think uh, to be called pakhtun pakhtun kwa and they have been given that uh, name today we know what happened with bangladesh it's gone it's not there anymore the only other place which wanted pakistan is pakhtun kwa if you say uh, so it in that uh, in that term uh, or north west frontier province and we can see what's happening over there there's discontent whether it is in favor or against favor but the reality is every day bombs are exploding in peshawar and so on and so forth pakistan government has lost its uh, moral authority in baluchistan has lost its moral authority in uh, in sind in 1948 we were told listen guys you are muslim we are muslim you are sunni we are sunni so let us unite on a common ground and answer was given to pakistan like pretty much like the uh, uh, european union today on that basis look at the vision of the baluch baluch at that time we are called tribal people we are called also some name today by pakistan these very tribal people these very backward people which you called gave you solution in this region would have would have been lasting peace they said okay you recognize us as as us at a state and we recognize you as a state and on state level we can have communication and trade and this is what european union today is so you have your entity you have your right and we have our entity we have our right as independent state as independent state naturally this answer was not acceptable to mr jinnah in 1948 it mobilized troops you know pakistan did not have the strength or the morality to do to take such a action 7th of august jina actually recognized baluchistan prior to being independent on the 11th that baluchistan is an independent <coughs> state it recognized guess who told them why the hell did you do that this country is there for you taking and that happens to be my friend was uk again and i really cannot see up to this day what uk policy has changed toward baluchistan is still hostile toward baluchistan i don't know why i'm not a such a theoretician to analyze what is the reason behind it but one thing is certain when uh, mr zardari stood in front of the british parliament he said pakistan was created by british and british always been a good friends to us so there's uh, entity in that uh, uh, respect what pakistan has done since uh, in baluchistan is to divide us on two ideological bases on the basis of either we are communist or we are some kind of uh, socialist or we are they can't use the word muslim or sunni because we are the same yeah in that respect we are majority of the baluch 95% are sunni muslim if you want to destroy a nation destroy its language destroy its culture introduce an alien ideology this is the trap our younger generation has fallen into it is more so on my uh, occupied iran side where there are multitude of organization who rallied behind uh, uh, organization like fedaeen uh, komla uh, not komla uh, pekar um, and few other organization which i can't at the moment uh, skips my mind on the baluchistan side a uh, few group of people adopted the ideology of socialism and communism and got taken away with that so now what we have inside baluchistan not only that we have to fight the uh, our oppressors but now there's ideological struggle in between 
somebody will say, this guy is mullah, this guy is a socialist, okay? What they fail to realize, we are living under colonization. This is not what we should be divided uh, on the line. This is what your enemy is using against you. It using every single kind of uh, weapon it can find. You know, in Pakistan arsenal, whether it's a nuclear weapon, to conventional weapon, chemical weapon, or biological weapon, it has been used in Balochistan, one way or the other. The nuclear attacks which were carried out in the Chag Chagi area, Baloch people, uh, Balochistan is a kind of dry, arid land in places. And the water system flows through what is called karais. They are 30 feet deep in some places, more than that. And people dig out the water through the wells. When the nuclear explosion is done, when the rain comes in, this nuclear radioactive material goes through the water system. For the generations, the people are poisoned. I call upon the uh, bodies which look into these kind of things uh, to carry out a research into Balochistan that how many people in Balochistan are dying of because of radiation poisoning? How many children are born, uh, what you call it, uh, handicapped? handicapped. Yes, thank you. Okay? And in terms of chemical and biological weapon, it's been used. We have reported it. In terms of uh, brutality, people were being boiled alive. Yes, boiled alive in Bukti areas, one by one. Asked question where your gorillas are hiding. The guys probably didn't know. They were ordinary shepherds. One at a time were boiled three of them. When in 1973, three and a half thousand Mari uh, were butchered using the, uh, the Iranian Air Force and the Pakistani Air Force together. Where was the world? Where was this United Nations, so, uh, so called? United Nations, supposed to protect the weak. Okay, we are told your internal problem of uh, Pakistan. If we are internal problem Pakistan, we are internal, then we deal with the situation as we see best. Leave us to it. If you cannot aid, do not uh, stand in our way either. On the class which I discussed, but there's one more element in the class which they have divided us. It's called Sardars. You know, guys, we are not oppressing you. It's the Sardar who was oppressing you. Further division. It's the Sardar who was not allowing you uh, to develop your region. Wait a minute. Let me agree with you for a minute. What you say is true. Aren't you the federal government, so-called federal government or central government, whatever you like to call yourself, allocate money without accountability? So why are you doing that? Because what you're saying to these puppets which you have put forward, take this money, be quiet, and let us get on with exploiting your country. OK? So all along is divide, 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 and exploit. This is the strategy of Pakistan toward the Baloch. Even to my brothers in Northwest Frontier Province, look at the name of your region, they call it Northwest Frontier Problem, Province. What is it controlled by? A political agent. From the time of the British, the policy has not changed. Okay? The Pakistan never existed as a country. It does not have a history. The group of people which was assigned to run this country were so-called the Punjabis. The policy of the Pakistan was written by people who came from India, so-called Muslims. Okay, it's the policy of Pakistan is not written by the sons of the soil. It is dictated by people coming from outside. Now, without having a history, these group of people, if you look at the Punjab history, it's a large farming land, basically, more pretty much like the Nebraska, plains of Nebraska. So in a farm, you can have up to 30,000 people working for a one landlord, for one feudal lord. These feudal lords were now given a modern state. They had no idea how to govern it. So the only thing they could think of governing it is through iron fist. OK? It is the iron fist policy. And for that iron fist, they need a strong army. How are you going to get this strong army budget? You have to create a monster. The monster became India. Okay? 
So through this, uh, through this process, they continued building this army and continued to a point now it is uh, 750,000 army alone. If you take the police, if you take the uh, frontier corps, and if you take the civil bureaucracies, if you put them all together, the economy of Pakistan cannot support such an army. Okay? So who's supporting this army? Where does it get them by getting the money from? We know it's riding two dragons, or one dragon or one eagle. It's got legs on both of them. It's flying in mid-air with both of them. You know, it's the case of the tail is wagging the dog. Yeah? The tail is being the Pakistan, and the dog being the two countries, the two superpowers. It's amazing how this insignificant countries is dictating to the superpowers what it should do. The last meeting which took place, it did not take place in Washington. It took place in Islamabad. So the policies of Washington are now being made in Islamabad. It's amazing, you know, it's just unthinkable. The dragon, i.e. China, will never abandon Pakistan, no matter how much the U.S. supports it. Okay? This is dragon territory. The next uh, rising power, superpower, is meant to be not China, and, uh, not United States, it's actually meant to be India. But India as a superpower, or rising superpower, has not played its role in the region. It has, this region of uh, uh, sphere of influence is controlled by others. So, Pakistan genocide policy, which is quite interesting, in 1971, when Mujibur Rahman came to Pakistan, who won by election, we are told, you know, listen guys, why don't you ask for autonomy? Why don't you settle down for uh, something of that nature? Or maybe self-determination? 1971, may I remind you? Mujibur Rahman won, won on basis of one man, one vote. He came to be uh, the Prime Minister of Pakistan. What the army people did is put him behind the bars. Mujib knew they're going to kill him. So he said, listen guys, don't kill me. Let me go. Whatever you want, I will sign. Whatever. So they said, okay, sign this paper. You're not going to play a role in politics and this, that, the other. He says, whatever, sign. Probably they gave him a lot of money as well. He, he signed. He said, can I go to Bangladesh now? I'd like to go to my home. He said, yeah, you can go. As soon as he landed on the Bangladesh airport, he presented the six-point plan to Pakistan. If it is that not acceptable to you, then he said, because his own people, remember, this is the country where the most Pakistani flag were flying. They were Muslim, Sunni Muslim, st still are Sunni Muslim. So how are you going to tell them to separate from this, uh, this country, which they have uh, basically voted for? So he presented the six-point plan, which were quite reasonable, which was not asking for anything uh, unreasonable. It was basically asking control of their own resources, their own economy. So what was the Pakistan solution to the six-point plan? Before, even they left Pakistan, the General Niazi and, and the bunch, they met in Lard Khanna, in uh, Zulpakar Ali's Bhutto's house. He was promised, you will be, Zulpakar Ali was promised, you're going to become the next Prime Minister. This is what we're going to do, Operation Blitz. That's what they call it, Operation Blitz, it's amazing. Not Operation Reconcile, Operation Blitz. And they went into Bangladesh. These are not my figure, Accord, according to the Bengali's own sources figure, more than three million Bengalis were butchered, unarmed. 450,000 women were raped. These are not my figure, could be wrong, could be right, I'm not disputing, but these are the figures my Bengali friends have given to me. So I'll go with that. So what would happen at the end? Nazi Germany took six years to kill six million people. This army, in nine months, killed three million Bengalis. It would have continued further. It has not been the intervention of India. Remember that. 
This is the ruthless army we're talking about. After this army, soldiers who were kept in prison were brought. They were sent to Balchistan for what? To build their morals again. And they did butchery in Balchistan. We were not spared either. Today, there are, I'm told, 144 women are present. And amongst them, some children in hundreds. I don't have the exact figure. And the ra age ranges from one year to 12 years. Now tell me something. These little children, are they capable of fighting? Are they capable of uh, standing against the world's seventh largest army? Our fighters, our resistors, who are in the mountains, who are fighting, they are fighting this largest army and they brought it to the knees. Seriously, they have brought it to the knees. But they can't do anything much to us. You know, there's a saying, you can break my bones, you can kill me, right? But you cannot have my obedience if I don't give it to you. That's the lessons the pa Baloch have taught Pakistan. All right? Resistance. So our resistance has been armed resistance, which Munir gave the dates and so on, made my life easy, so I don't need to go into it. That will be repeating. Political organization. Unfortunately, I'm a bit disappointed with my political organization, although they are very much more politicized than I am and much more knowledgeable than I am. But they are fighting on basis of ideology. We need to go beyond that. We need to unite all the people. Then there are political uh, parties. They are bigger, uh, biggest, uh, more disappointment because they are most, more or less saying to us, except Pakistan, except the uh, autonomy and so on and so forth. We did that. We did that in 1972. The, the Pakistan People's Party, a democratically elected government, democratic, I'm putting under, quoted, under courts because General Niazi and Butch met him beforehand in Larkana. One promised him you will become prime minister. Okay, so this democratically elected party, so-called democratic, gave the reason that you cannot control smuggling. Therefore, we are going to dissolve your government. If that's true, I'm sure the millions and millions of tons of heroin which uh, gets smuggled through Pakistan on that basis, then Pakistan should dissolve itself. True. Personality. Now, this is the worst thing in the uh, Baluchi street. What we have gone, we have gone beyond personality. Some personality I respect. My hero, truly my hero, is Noroz Khan. Although the first person who took up armed resistance was Agha Abdul Karim. He spent 28 years behind the bars, which we don't know. Our history, for some reason, our modern organization has kept this quiet. I don't know why. Okay, 28 years is a long time, longer than Nelson Mandela. Yeah. But the, sir, the other Sardar actually did not join him, did not join in the struggle. Okay, and people like Noros Khan rose up with band up less than 70 men. He went into the mountain. 20,000 troops were engaged. Pakistani 20,000 troops were engaged, but nobody could bring him down. It was the Baluch who brought him down. Let this known be in this tree. It was the Baluch. It was the Baluch who persuaded him to come down. We need to learn that from our history. Now, yes, the Pakistan military took the Quran and so on and so forth and took a oath that, you know, we will not uh, harm you and so on. So when the man came down, they arrested him. They arrested his son. They put him in prison and they told him, oh, uh, just ask for clemency and we will let you go and your son. And he told them basically, I prefer to stay in the prison. So they hanged his children, they hanged his colleagues, and he died in the prison himself at the age of 90 without compromising. So this is why I'm saying he's my hero. But even on personality basis, if another Noros Khan today came in, it would not be enough. We need to move beyond personality 
and people in the Balochistan have used personality politics for their own gain. That Balochistan has become a business shop, and this business shop needs to shut down. We need to move toward unity and toward our ultimate goal. I will touch the, uh, on this other bit later as well. Freedom challenges. Pakistan and Iran, yeah, they have their interest. Without Balochistan, there is no Pakistan. Simple as that. It is the Baloch gold which gave Pakistan its entity in the world to do, be able to do business. We have a history of 10,000 year old, okay? But we are told, you're not mature enough to be an independent country, take autonomy or whatever you can. This country which came carved out of the, on the religious ground is given all the support it needs. Interesting, isn't it? As Muni said, for their strategical game. Now, Iran is lucky. It's got 50% of Balochistan without much of a trouble. And Iran then be, has been ruthless on the other side. It has destroyed the Baloch culture, more or less eliminated it. What is the now remained is basically their own language has remained. Uh, traditional values have remained. But in all other aspect, which I'm sure uh, my other brothers are going to go into it, so I really don't want to spend much time on that. Class. We still have the Nawabs, we still have the Sadars. Not though as respected as in the past, but we still have them. Remember, it's the same Sadar. The Pakistani army in 1948 did not flew in C-130 Hercules aircraft to land in Kalat. It went through the territories of the Sardars. Where were they? Were they sleeping? No, they were not sleeping. You know why? Because before that, uh, the uh, Jam of Las Bela, the state of Kharan, and another was the state. Can you remind me? Uh, Makran, state of Makran, under Nawab Bai Khan. They actually wrote to Jinnah, if you give us three states, we are going to be with you. And the rest of the Sardar kept quiet. To keep quiet, you are equally guilty. Just because you did not go and shake hand with the NCB, uh, with Jinnah, does not make you, you know, innocent. They're a force coming to take over your country. And you're going to say, listen, although they are doing it, but I'm going to remain quiet. Aga Abdul Karim took up arms. Nobody went with him. OK? Then Noros Khan, nobody went with him. Yeah? But today, things are different. Although in our history, three Sardars have taken a strong position, and one of them have given his life. He showed the other leaders how to die how to carry out a struggle and how to die, and I salute him for it. Although his earlier uh, uh, life experience that he did, if anybody wants to learn from this uh, cooperating with Pakistan, he should learn from Nawab Akbar Bukti. In his life, he actually believed working with Pakistan, within Pakistan, is, is for the betterment of Balochistan. He believed that. When he realized Pakistan only interest is to eliminate the Baloch, from the land of Balochistan, he took up arms, like the others b b before him. But he continued until he died. He set a new phase for the Baloch movement. Still today, uh, there are ideological differences, as I said. Before in, Baloch uh, in Balochistan in 1948, if we go back, the, uh, there was only uh, one ideology, the ideology of Islam, Muslim. Then we had the challenges of Sardar. But today, in Balochistan, see, the problem is this. Whenever some group of people read few books, and they come up with an ideology, without actually taking every element of the society, how does it affect this? If you want to destroy a nation, change its culture. That's what it is. If your culture, if the ideology you bring from the time of the birth to the grave can co is a complete ideology, then okay. Otherwise, leave it aside. Let's not f us fight on that ideological basis. Incentive. 
Some people are given the position of Chief Minister of Baluchistan, governors, senators. Yeah? Whenever you recognize a state in international law, you are regarded as a rebel, not as a prisoner of war. That's international law. When Umar Mukhtar was in jail on the court, he was asked three questions. Did you ever take subsidiary from the government for good behavior? Did you ever recognize the rule? He answered the three questions and said, no, no, no. These people who are chair, uh, the governors, who are chief ministers, they can't say that, or senators, because they've been part and parcel of the system. International community is also our challenge to our freedom because it has its own interest, which I think I better deal with the next slide because it's a large topic. Afghanistan. You know, Afghanistan, if it wasn't for the Baluch, Afghanistan still would have been under the Iranian Empire now. It was actually the Baluch who established the Afghanistan. So with Afghanistan, we have no beef. In fact, we have lived very friendly with that country. In our difficult time, it has sheltered us. In their difficult time, we help them. And we want this relationship to continue. To say the bonds between the Afghan uh, and the Baluch, I'll, uh, I'll give it to you in a nutshell. Khan of Khalad is Aynas Khan of Khalad. His mother is a Patan, is a Pashtun. Nawab Khair Bakshmari, his mother is a Pashtun. His wife is a Pashtun. So th that gives you some idea that how close the Baluch and the Pashtun are bonded. So they are not, we, if anything, they are, can, be, uh, uh, can become our allies. Some people have made mistakes. We never, in, Baluch never interfere uh, wherever they live in a, in a local people's uh, politics. For example, we are living in the Middle East. Oman uh, army, 75% is Baluch. But we never regard it as part of Balochistan. We say that's their land. We live as a guest. India. As I spoke earlier on, India is supposed to be, the, according to Japanese report, supposed to be the next superpower. You know, if, <laughs> if it's going to be next superpower, it's going to be one superpower without any spine. This little country, which has been carved out of it, is holding at ransom for the past 60 years. And they continue to talk and fight and talk and fight. They had more fight than the Baloch and the, uh, the Pakistani had fight together. What is the purpose of all this fighting? You fight, gain a little ter uh, territory on each side and sit down? Whose interest is in this? I, don't, I, really, I really don't understand the Indian philosophy how it goes. In 1971, it was a perfect opportunity. You split the country into half. Why not go all the way? What stopped you? Now this monster has grown further because it will grow further. You know why? The dragon is behind it. The dragon has given it a nuclear technology. It's given it a missile technology. It doesn't care, it's riding the eagle. It's basically told the, you can get as much help from the eagle as you can, money-wise, arm-wise. F-17 Thunderbird, which Pakistan has developed, I bet you it's a copy of the F-16, yeah? And Pakistan hasn't got this kind of technology to develop it. It's the reverse engineering of American technology by the Chinese. I'm fair to assume that. I was selling software once in the, uh, uh, in Middle East. And the ter one of the territories were given to me was Pakistan. He says, you take care of it since you're from the SLS and then they will hang me when I go there. So anyway, there was an occasion where they, uh, I had to go to Islamabad and speak to the military brass with all the thing uh, to, uh, to give a talk on the software. My safety was guaranteed by my uh, CEO and so on, who was a Frenchman. I got there and I gave a talk, and I will cut the story short, and the, the software license for one license what was uh, $20,000. One of the guys stood up there and says, oh, that's very expensive. I said, no, no, it's not expensive. It's your economy is too weak. If it was 20,000 rupees, would you say that's expensive? He said, oh, no, no, that will be cheap. I said, well, then that's your economy. You need to talk to your generals and colonels and whatever why your economy is in such a mess, okay? What I'm trying to say here, this country, and uh, at the time I was uh, noting the PC, which is supposed to be controlling the uh, 
their nuclear, you know, whatever. Yeah? This PC took 20 minutes to boot. And I said, listen to guys, India fires a missile, you maybe have less than four minutes to respond. Your PC just took 20 minutes. Yeah? So, in a sense, it has been. I'm sorry, I'm just telling you the time that you are. My time is getting better. Well, I'll uh, no, speed no, up no, a bit. No, no, I'm just telling you that you are over 25 minutes. Okay, I'll <laughs> turn a bit. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, again, we will come to back to UK, and the UK up to this day is supporting Pakistan. It has not presented any alternative ide ideology. The China and the Pakistan is, uh, is a kind of fox, you know, it's, it's really, a really clever devil. It's now acting uh, the go-between between China and the Islamic world. It's building that kind of relationship. And you have seen uh, the, some of the business taking place in Saudi Arabia and the other places. U USA, UK, Canada, Australia, Russia, and European Union, they have also have their interest in Balchistan. This could be on mineral. I think the Shell company, probably Britain has 45% share in it, which is extracting the sui gas. So it's the reason for think to think about. So given all these channel challenges, we really need to unite. If we don't, we're going to perish. Can we unite on ideology? If you are a communist, I'm a Muslim. I'm a, uh, I'm a devout Muslim. I actually believe in this uh, ideology of Islam. So how are we going to talk to each other? How are we going to get together? We are not. 95% of the Balochistan is Muslim. So we can't really do it on an ideological basis. How about on traditional class rallying behind the Sardars? We know Sardars have their own interest. They have let us down in 1948. And they let us down in 1958. Okay. How about personality? Personality, yes. Uh, bring Noros Khan alive, yes. I will follow him. Uh, but can you guarantee me a personality is not going to take a U-turn? You can't. Personality can change. How about political organization? Uh, listening to their idea of federalism and trying to do something in that way. Yeah. Which political organization? They're all infiltrated. Political parties, yeah, again, same thing. How about as Baloch? Hang on a minute. Isn't Aslam Raisani a Baloch? Gaurana and Maxi is a Baloch, but they were with Pakistan. Yeah? We really need to unite on a policy of freedom. I don't care what your organization is, what your philosophy is. In a free, independent Balochistan, you can campaign on your ideological basis and become the next uh, ruling government. But right now, we need to put all that aside. We need to unite on the simple call of freedom. On policy, okay? So how are you going to do that? I'm asking the organizations not to merge. That would be disaster. Merging would be a disaster. I want to, uh, I'm asking to unite on policy. Again, I'm uh, stressing on independent Balochistan, and no to Pakistan and Tehran. Anything they end out is no. Whether it's autonomy, whether it's federalism, whether it's uh, chief ministership or directorship or whatever, they dish out, no. You are the masters of your land. Don't be beggars. Be, be the master of your land. Unite on policies. All decision made by the, these uh, organizations when they get together, I'm asking them to get together, decision would be made on consensus. No one would be allowed to make unilateral decision. No direct negotiation with Pakistan, because you have seen it. Throughout the history, they have betrayed you. Number many, many times. So don't believe them. Anything they say is a lie. Unless there is an international guarantor there, who can guarantee you. If they can't, if they say we can't, then we continue our struggle on our own. This council is to write the constitution of Balochistan. What is it going to be? If I sit down and write the constitution, it's my constitution, not the constitution of all the uh, uh, parties concerned. What do you call this council? Why not call it Council for Independent Balochistan? We will, like the Palestinians got UN membership, we will apply. We will seek uh, um, a methodology to get into it. 
this body will write the foreign policies, how to deal with this, all these various countries, like India, uh, USA, China, Pakistan, uh, not Pakistan, uh, European Union, and so on and so forth. Internal policies, we have to develop our internal policies, what's going to be. We have to show to the world we are a nation. We are not a bunch of uh, nitwits in the world. The council will develop the health and education policy, cultural language pol uh, body to deal with the cultural and language Pacific development because there are many people who are uh, doing work on this, but they are not uh, nurtured. We need to nurture them all. We need to have a media team. We do not need to rely on CNN or any other media to give us an interview or. Uh, give us a glimpse. We need to have 7 by 24 our own media. We need industrial development. We need to talk about how the industrial development is going to take place. Because that is key important. That's it. It's concluded. Thank you very much. Sorry I took a, bit, a little bit more time, but uh, we did start one hour late. I thank you.